Buenos días. Good morning. Desde Fuenlabrada. From Fuenlabrada, Madrid. Good afternoon, in Sydney. Uh, historical. This is a historical landmark event, and this is how we feel at the Maria Pages Center in Fuenlabrada, because now we can bring the periphery closer to the universality that is somehow part of the periphery too. In this gathering of friends, we will bring together from these two poles, Rafael Bonachela and Maria Pages. Rafael is in Sydney and Maria Pages is in the wonderful city of Fuela Brada. This series was born out of something that we did during the pandemic, something that we called conversations at Fuenlabrada. So the cycle is still called the same, but it has a new dimension. It's called Dance and Diaspora, Spanish creators around the world, is focusing on the aim of giving voice and bringing back to Spain, their home country, great creators who are developing their career outside Spain, abroad. This cycle will start, will start now and will go all the way to December and we will have Leon Montero Panadero. It's an important initiative because what we want to do is to make to make sure that people at home understand what Spanish creators are doing abroad and to also show that Spain is exporting talent, knowledge, and of course, the work that Rafael is doing is great. Rafael is today, in our opinion, the beacon of dance in Australia. He has for years created one of the best ballet companies in the world. And he is there. He's resilient. He is advocating a creative project, which at the end of the day, encapsulates the Spanish sage, the Spanish DNA around and disseminates it around the world. We want to make sure that contemporary heritage interact dynamically, transferring contents. These great Spanish creators can meet here because there is an important point, which is that Rafael is an influential figure. He has a great impact in Spain, even though it's not properly acknowledged. He deserves a national award, and I think it must be said, Rafael, due to his career, and thanks to what he's doing and will do, he's a very young artist. So I think it's time for Spain to acknowledge his grandeur. So thank you. This journey has a great institution as a travel companion. And the institution is the Cervantes Institute. And the fact that we are bringing together to, to bring this city, the Maria Pajes Center, to take it around the world through our creators, and in this case, through Rafael, makes today being a historical landmark. I want to thank Coral, the Cervantes Institute at Sydney director, and I want to thank my colleagues working here at our center that have created this wonderful match, which I believe and I hope that will be the first of many. So I think we can certainly, from Fuenlabrada, advocate and defend the Spanish culture with capital C. Without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to the Spanish ambassador in Australia. And then 
I will give the floor to Maria. Rafael, thank you very much for being with us today. You know, we love you. We just love you. That's it. No secrets. We love you. There you go. Thank you. Buenas tardes desde Australia. Buenos días. Good afternoon from Australia. Good morning. I am the Spanish ambassador in Spain. For me, it's a pleasure to address you today to open the cycle of conversation Dance and Diaspora organized by the Cervantes Institute with the collaboration of the Maria Pajes Choreography Center. Uh, I am a fan of dance in all types because dance is one of the greatest expressions of Spanish culture and tradition, one of the key objectives of Spanish embassies abroad and of the Institute Cervantes in the world to support our creators and artists, dancers, choreographers, dance companies, etc. This activity is very interesting, truly relevant, because it's not only about supporting the culture in general, but supporting our choreographers in Spain so that they go abroad, so that they collaborate, so that they travel, so that they collaborate with other artists and companies, foreign companies, at the end of the day, to disseminate our culture. Abroad. It is not easy to travel due to the current circumstances. International mobility is restricted due to the pandemic. So, artists, young artists, have a difficult time to pursue their careers abroad. Nowadays. This is the beginning of a cycle with this conversation. That we, will, uh, we have a conversation online from Australia between Maria Pajes, dancer, choreographer, and director, designer, and creator of the Maria Pajes Center, the Spanish dancer based in Australia, Rafael Bonachela. From the Sydney Dance Company, with the technical support of the Sydney Cervantes Institute, I am firmly convinced that this conversation of these two dancers will be very enriching for those of you listening to this event, especially those who want to start an international career. So I wish you a very interesting and fruitful activity. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. El Arbi for this wonderful presentation. And here we are, Rafa. Such a pleasure to see you. I mean, this is uh, something that I was so much looking forward to. It's such a pleasure to have you, to see you. We were chatting earlier, and this is one of those things that the pandemic has brought us. We are strengthening communication despite of the distance. And here we are today. I mean, we are not touching, we're not feeling each other, but hey, we can listen to each other. And um, we have a group of people who are following us and who I am sure will we'll come out of this conversation knowing a bit more about who Rafa Bonatella is, which is a lot, by the way. So how are you? How are things? Well, I'm really well. I'm super happy and I'm terribly excited to be here with you today, being able to chat with you. I also want to say thanks, Arvi, for this beautiful introduction. I really liked it. And I want to thank the ambassador too. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've been for months talking about this conversation, and here we are today at last. This is our 10th week of lockdown, no, week 12 of lockdown in Sydney, because we had had to stop working and go into lockdown. But as you said, it's really important that we can talk, communicate and share with you 
And of course, with uh, all the spectators. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. So yeah, I'm very happy, really well. OK. One of the things uh, that we do is to do things first things first, because to, when you get into the dance world, all children, of course, in the world we're living today, civilized world, we go to school and children, everybody does their own thing. And from a very early age, you start seeing things. But I mean, getting into the world of dance for girls, I've always thought, we've always thought that it's easier because it's a bit like, I don't know, in a way, it's part of being a girl. Sort of like, you're a girl, you, do, you go into dance, but what about you? How did you get there? I mean, it's your life now. Dance becomes our meaning of life. How did you start? You're from Catalonia, right? From real Catalonia. I was born in La Garriga, a village not far away from Barcelona. My parents are from Almeria, from Andalusia. My father is from Tijola, and my mother's side of the come of, of the family are from Lucar, Almeria. And there was some immigration in Spain in the 1960s. And my father emigrated to one village and my mother to another one. They met and there I was born. In the 1970s, I was born in 1972. I'm the eldest of four brothers, okay? 1992, and then suddenly I like dancing. Not like, I love dancing with passion. I love dancing. My parents, were two young persons with four children working in the textile industry. And I never, ever, I never had an elder sister that went to dance, nothing. Because in my village, there was no dance school at the time. And I must say that La Garriga, my village, had a very rich cultural life because our lady mayor was a very cultivated person and she was promoting culture. There was theater, there was musical during summer, the village festivities. But dance, I saw Michael Jackson on television doing Thriller and I thought, wow, this is it. I was never taken to a theater to watch a dance performance. I was never taken to Barcelona to see dance. So we didn't have the means. It wasn't part of our family life. So I, with my school friends, we did a dance, okay? I love just organizing a dance. I, I, yeah, that's it. You just created a piece. Exactly. No, I had a tape recorder and I took the tape recorder to the school courtyard. And we had like when you went home back for lunch and then you came back home and we met a bit before school under a tree with a tape recorder to play a, a, a cassette with Meccano and Madonna songs. But it was very pop, pop music. But I had never seen classical ballet, contemporary dance, nothing. There was no YouTube at the time. So imagine, I mean, if you managed to catch something on television out of mere luck, then, but then there was the serious fame. Yeah, you're right. This is so important. What you've just said about Michael Jackson, I've heard it before. Another great creator like you. Cherkawi always said to me, I remember I danced because of Michael Jackson. Lacan too. It's Michael Jackson too. So imagine the influence, impo imagine the importance. These are signs. I mean, I, that video was a big revolution. It was like a 10 minute piece of dancing. It was truly influential at the time. So the first image you saw was Michael Jackson. And that's amazing. It's true that in our culture and in our education system, dance is not part of the syllabus in a mainstream way. You get to know contemporary dance afterwards. I remember the first time I saw contemporary dance because flamenco, as you can imagine, in Seville, I mean, I started listening to flamenco and seeing flamenco way before I was actually aware that that could be a profession. The contemporary dance, I remember the first time I saw it was in Madrid, Caroline Carlson show. I went by myself because I was living here in Madrid by myself. I was like 16, 17 years old and I saw her. I mean, the importance of first times. I saw her lines, all her clean, minimalistic. And that really has an imprint on you. I, 
my first job was the with the nomina imperial you remember and i was six i was 16 i was given a contract and i had never seen a contemporary dance show before ever so imagine the company had started two years before I had taken some contemporary lessons and a teacher said to me, ah, there is a contemporary dance a company called La Anonima, I think you should go and audition. And I thought, okay, I will. I was sort of like second year of secondary education or something like that, baccalaureate maybe. And I was like doing two classes a week because my parents allowed me to commute to Barcelona by train because when I was 15, I said, I want to dance. And my parents went, but this boy. So, but, but my father was from the south, south and he said, if you want to dance, just dance flamenco. But at the time, flamenco in Catalonia was difficult to see. I wanted to do for jazz. I didn't want to be contemporary dance. It was Leroy, it was famed characters. So I signed a contract, my parents signed a contract to, to, to dance with Anlo Anonima because I wanted to dance. And all of a sudden I was with a company touring in Paris, Rome and Europe, and I was 17. My mother gave me a chain with a phone number and you know, I was that small. And I started watching contemporary dance because I was working with a contemporary dance company and I didn't have any training. I was like, you do that. And I did it. And I just, I could. It was like very natural. But I didn't have a chance to, to see anything. I'm listening to you now. And I think that, I mean, people ask, who have been your masters and influences? And during our life, you don't sometimes acknowledge or aware who the true masters were, who had an influence and you discover that they were afterwards when you are older. When you're older, you realize that apart from your teachers at school or masters, they, they, the beacons are those who help you making decisions. Teachers, and I'm listening to you and I think that when your teacher said to you, I think you go on audition for that company, that sentence per se is like, that was like a turning point for you because you if you don't have someone who knows you who helps you because i'm sure that would be that would a key piece of advice right i mean the fact that you're doing contemporary dance imagine there is a flamenco person who said to you go and audition flamenco because they because you are a person who danced in general sort of out of mere utter need. No, it's just that, you just said it earlier, children who who, who go and dance, this, this, that's, that's another talk for two hours because this is before they did Billy Elliot. It, it's you against your village because they would call you all names, they would throw stones at you. I mean, it was easy, right? It, it wasn't easy, but I loved it so much. And sometimes when something is very difficult, you never find, you know, hurdles. And sometimes you feel, okay, this is hard. And I always try and remember the feeling I had when I was a kid of what, how much I loved beat dancing, the purity of being able to express myself, of practicing and practicing, and it works, and it works, and I do it well. I also remember I went to, to high school, right? And there was a girl from Barcelona who was in my high school and she was a dancer of the teatro. And she explained to me, this is plie, this is relieve. And I thought, all right, things have a name. Movements have names. So I, have, I was 15 and I thought, I loved dancing. I, I did dance, but I didn't know the movements had name like plie. And then I had this obsession. So this has a name, people have a premiere, but in Barcelona at the time, it was hard to go to the conservatory unless you had started when you were eight. So everything was really difficult to access. So it was really hard. I remember I, I, I saw Victor Ullate and I thought I want to do that. But they were in Madrid, everything was far away, and I ended up in London, what a paradox. But 
just once conversations. And I will remember Neus Ferrer. And she said, there is a contemporary dance company. I didn't even have a clue of what that was. I wanted to dance, that was it. It's just the need, as you said. And also, it looks like, I mean, I was in Seville and it was completely different, but one of the teachers I had at school, no, in class, I didn't get up. I learned how to dance because you would arrive to your dance academy, you got your position, so you would take your turn because there were other mothers with other girls that would attend the same academy, but they were there to dance. So how do you learn from a girl that was in front of you in the Alameda de Hercules, Gavita Domingo, and you would have to sit there and wait for your turn. So whilst you wait for your turn, you had seen 30 dances danced by 10 girls. So you would learn from watching how they would move the arms, and, but the, the teacher would never stand up to say, you know, how to do things. And uh, there was a listen, uh, learning by listening. And you will learn that from, from an early age. And yes, as you said, there was, there was no conservatory in Seville. I come from another world, but the, the way we did things is very similar. And the, we just, in that, in that girl or that boy, there is the eagerness to dance and you set up your own challenges every day. You think, I can do this, I'm gonna do this. And the happiness of seeing that you're actually doing it, that you've made it, and that's wonderful. And it's great to go back to that. At what age did you start dancing? I was very small. I've, I've danced all my life. No, because you had that need. But the practice, of course, if, I, when I was six months old at the fair in Seville with the flowers, with the tiny little flamenco shoes. And I couldn't even stand or walk, but I had flamenco shoes when I was six months. So, I mean, it's true. That's a, that leaves a, you know, an imprint in you. And if, if it's something that you like, because at home nobody danced in my family. Yeah, I was going to ask you if somebody in your family danced. No, no, not at all, just like you. But you, you, they supported you, right? Yeah, they did. My parents did not really understand if this could be a job or a profession. That's why they forced me to finish Baccalaureate and the contemporary dance company. Imagine my children going to the flower market where I, performed for the first time when I was 17, when I, with a show, you know, very contemporary, where there was even no music. They had seen me dancing in my village, doing Michael Jackson, and then they see me on stage doing this. But anyway, it's the journey we've done together, my family and I, and it's been beautiful. But they never really, I mean, they supported me all the way through. They were always there for me. That's key because it is true. I mean, why dance sometimes finds someone who is resisting or objecting dance? I mean, there were so full of prejudices. It, I don't know, it still is, right? Yes, it is. Because I have a nephew who wants to dance and my brother supports him and they, he would love that. But society has some sort of objection, especially if you're a boy, that is hard. And why do you think that is? Because we think at the center, we're always thinking about doing initiative to raise awareness in society, to overcome all these prejudices. We always say that dance is the poor sister, but it's the great unknown form of art. What do you think? It's a great unknown, yeah. And an art form. We all of, all of us have a body. Everybody has a body. We can understand our body. We can move. Everybody likes moving. 
dance gives us so much. One of the things I enjoy the most, completely the opposite when we were talking, when you go to Cuba, all parents in Cuba want their children to be a dancer. Whenever I go there, I say, I mean, I don't believe it. This is absolutely amazing. It's right the opposite of the rest of the world when sort of like, if you just tell someone that they want to be a ballerina, they get scared in the rest of the world. But if you go to Cuba, it's an honor that your child becomes a dancer. So it's like, I don't know. This yeah, but why in Cuba? This happens in Cuba because there is a social awareness, a political work in society that has influenced the whole society, where dancers have a status in society, they are acknowledged in society. When I was a kid, for example, here, my parents wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. All my brothers and sisters, they wanted them to be a lawyer and a doctor because we think that is sort of like reaching a proper social status in Cuba or Russia is the other way around. Dance is acknowledged socially because there is a previous political work which has not happened here. I don't know in Australia. How is, how is it in Australia? It's the same. In Australia, it's the same. Dance is the last thing, but arts is something they need to justify that they exist. And that's sad. And sometimes I try not to pay too much attention to that because if I do, I lose in a way my, my motivation and I get frustrated. But hey, here, in Australia, sports is really popular. There is a lot of talent, very you know, promoted and fostered, but arts in general, dance in particular, we need to continue fighting and politically too. Politicians don't get votes for promoting arts, that's it. I mean, our prime minister here now has never been to a dance opera or music show ever. I mean, not all of them, we had had others who have showed interest for culture and what it means for society because it upholds us and makes us who we are. Especially now with COVID and post COVID, it's even more important. But here it's like, we see so it's an elite thing today. That's what people think, it's only for the elite, but it isn't at all. And the interesting thing which is great, is that dance is the people, the young, is the activity that young people do the first. So first swimming, second dance, that's what young people in Australia do, second activity. But when they are 13, 14, they lose it. They stop that. And there aren't so many dance companies, but I'm fighting, I'm always fighting. Yeah, and I, I see that you're fighting and I understand because it's frustrating to think that that happens and we don't make any progress because this is a conversation and sometimes us who work on this we feel the commitment with our cause this center the choreography center of course we need space and you know that in spain there there aren't spaces to create to to rehearse, but the other one was the idea of dignifying and promoting and disseminating and raising awareness politically. Otherwise, things don't make a progress. Politicians are those who make decisions. Decisions on culture are made by politicians and they are in charge of organizing our system. But we need to raise awareness, do sort of like a, a, you know awareness raising campaign with them because they make a decisions and then it has a social impact because society understand, needs to understand that we all have a body and any baby who, when they hear something with a rhythm, they react and they begin to dance. It's human. Dance is one of the the basic art forms of human beings. 
I mean, really, there's so much today. We always say the same thing, there's so much today, but we're at it. Yeah, I have learned with time, we can talk about this because this is important. We need to acknowledge that there is a lot of work to do, but when I have to talk to politicians and people who are going to make a decision, I never complain. I try and give solutions because they know. I mean, they know that they are giving very little money to, to culture. They spend more money in a car park than in arts, okay? At least here. So when I go and talk to them, I bring them suggestions and ideas on how to change things. Because whenever I go to complain, I realize that they know. And I come from England. I was in England for 20 years before I lived here. So how did you go to England? Because that, that's in an interesting transition. It's very weird. Like my whole career is strange. Things happen that shouldn't happen in a way. I mean, the day I stopped dancing, I thought, well, stop dancing professionally as a dancer for a company. I thought, I can't believe this has happened to me. And still, I live my life not, not, not believing that I'm doing this. This is what I've always enjoyed doing. We work hard and it's a lot of sacrifice and effort, but what happened to me was, so I worked with the Anonima. I, I had two pieces, Castroporos and Kairos, two pieces. So there was a lot of improvisation. I, we were like 17, 18, I was 18. And when I was touring with my company in Europe, we traveled a lot. We went to festivals and I saw the Netherlands dance theater, all the companies, and I thought, I need more training. Because the teacher, after a year of doing lessons, said to me, go to this company and through improvisation and what contemporary has of looking for the natural movements in dancers, because I was in that company, but I didn't do anything. So I was standing, when I was dally at lessons, I was behind someone, I would copy. It was like, I felt like, I'm gonna be caught, I'm an imposter. I don't have a clue. But since things came out naturally, I danced. And imagine I was dancing around the world and I saw a poster, auditioned for school in London. And I thought, I'll go. And I went to the audition and they gave me a scholarship. And the school was called the London Studio Center, who was a school which was not a contemporary dance. It was, it was like fame, fame, my dream, fame. I mean, there was, it is, it is you know, it's known for musicals. But it was also ballet, contemporary dance. There was just a bit of everything, but it was not the plays. It was not schools where people who knew went to London to, but I got a scholarship. My father talked to the mayor of the Elder Madriga and he said to her, my, my son has received a scholarship to go to London. And they, they gave my mom money for a plane ticket. The village, the mayoress gave money to my mother. My mother said, okay, if you got some money from the regional government. And I went to London and I was at this school with people singing. But at the time, I just wanted to get ballet lessons, Graham Cunningham contemporary lessons from within the, you know, you could choose your subjects. I did a little bit of singing as well, flamenco as well. There was just, it was like fame, the fame academy. And I wanted to know how to do things properly that I decided to do a turn. I want to do a turn because I know how to do it. I wanted to have a bit more understanding and, and, and background. I, I ended up on a stage dancing and that was very important for me. It's like a bit, everything is important, but I needed to focus on my training at the time. What, you know, what I couldn't do before when I was younger had it been a dance school in La Garriga, I would have attended it, but there wasn't one. It's not that I wasn't allowed, it's just that there wasn't one. So two years later, 
the teacher in London. So two years in London, I didn't go to any shows because I didn't have money for the tickets. I worked in a, in a theater selling ice cream and programs because that's where the dancers and the artists were. And the teacher said to me, there is a company called Rambert, who is the, which is the oldest company in England. They're going to have the 100th anniversary and they're having an audition. And I think you should go. That's, you know, that's the sentence. I think you should go to the audition. And I said, OK, I will register. And I got the job. Well, that, you know, that, that you know, locates you and places you in position. But then I knew a bit more, I had more technical knowledge, more understanding of my body. And I felt I was a little bit more prepared. I had done two years of obsession. It's hard. And in London, imagine, I won in 1990. This is 32 years ago in September. This conversation, we are holding 31st anniversary when I left my village, when I left La Carriga. Did you go from Seville to Madrid when you were 15? You were even younger. Yeah. I thought I was very old and mature and ready for it. And I went to, well, I finished my, conserv there was no conservatory in Seville. I had to go to the Cordoba Conservatory and there were like an advert for the National Ballet School in Madrid. And Maria Rosa, who my family knew her because she had gone to school with my mom. Maria Rosa offered me to go to Madrid with her company. So I went with my mom and my grandma. They left me in Glorieta de Bilbao in a house and I was there in a room and I, in a, I, was, I would go to the National Ballet lessons. I didn't really enjoy that. I mean, I was very young. I was a baby. I mean, look at it. But it was a learning experience where I could understand. In the past, I mean, there isn't such a big experience. What you can do in Seville, in Madrid, everything is the same. But at the time, to cross the, the Peñaperros Mountains mm, that separate Andalusia from Madrid is like going to another world. And it was another world. Madrid was different. Arriving to Madrid was a big impact, catching this, the underground, the tube. It was a big leap, but it was a continuous improvement. And I was from 10 in the morning to 10 in the evening, hectic. It was like I had a bag with me. The, I, the, the, the bag carried me instead of me carrying my bag. But there is something that you said, which is very important. And maybe people don't talk about it much because it seems that everything is pre-designed. But in dance, the decisions one makes in life, for which are constant, you must make decisions on what road to take, right? Where to go, what your pathway is going to be. These decisions are very important because dance is not designed with an itinerary, like, I don't know, you want to be a mathematician, so there is an itinerary for you. So you study baccalaureate, then you go to university, and everything, there is a, a plan for you. And then when you finish that plan, they tell you, you're a mathematician. But with dance, that is not the case. I'm listening to you, and you're telling me that you knew you had to take those classes, but it's you who creates your own itinerary. And I was like, at amor de Dios, thinking I need to go to learn to dance Jota. And you create your own pathway and your own decisions make it possible for you afterwards, start one way or another to make a mistake or not, or your capacity to develop that pathway, which gradually you create. But every day you had to make those decisions. Okay, do I stop this class? Do I move to another ballet master? Do I stay here? Do I go? So you make decisions all the time that have an influence on you. 
yeah i'm listening to you and thinking that at the time for me it was like i need to get out of barcelona i need to go because I could not go into the conservatory in Barcelona. Everything that was in Spain to be a dancer like I wanted to be, it was part of an institutionalized itinerary at the time. And maybe there is now, but at the time you couldn't go to a school when you were 16 or 18, as I did in London to start from scratch. I mean, it wasn't starting from scratch, but for me, there were very few male references. And that was important for me. It was I was the only young boy in my class. And this still happens, you know, that some days you have more students, some years, sorry, some years you have more students, but I wanted to see people that were a reference for me so that I could be like them. And I arrived in London and there were many of them. I mean, there were lessons only for, full of boys. And at the time, I swear that it would have been easier for me to stay in Spain, but there was nothing like that of being every day from 8.30 in the morning to seven in the evening, they taking dance lessons every day. England, I went there, you know, out of an adventure. I didn't want it to be the place, but the interesting thing is that I ended up in Rambert which is the contemporary company par excellence in England. And I remember that when I started with Rumbert, people said to me, have you been to London Studio Center? And I was like, yes, I went there, so what? But everybody was like, people, oh, dancers, don't, people, people who go to Rumbert don't come out from the London Studio Center. You could have gone to Royal Ballet, you could go here and there. Everything was also very, very, you know, it, and I said, okay, well, I come from there. So what? And I got a job and here I am. So that has happened to me more. There is like an instinct, I think. Sometimes it was like, I danced with Rambert and then I had the work with Kali Minogue and people would say to me, what is this guy doing? Contemporary dancer. Are you going to do something commercial? The end of the world is going to arrive to you. And uh, I want to do it. So, but I had to process it, right? You had to convince yourself. Yes, I did. And then somebody said to me that they were doing musicals in Broadway. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do Kylie Minogue because, oh, well, that was great. Yeah, it was. But it's true that especially for Kylie Minogue, right? But it's happened to me, like I've had the feeling inside that even though this is not what we normally do, it's what I think that I need to do. I need to try. And I have nothing to lose by doing fusion because we always learn and you can learn that you're not gonna do it again. I've learned that sometimes, yeah. never again. Because people see your CV and say, look at the things that you've done. Yeah, the things that I haven't done as well. Rambert Dance Company was a big decision. And for you, I guess, it was a big change, right? You, it introduced you internationally. I mean, contemporary dance is very international because that's another thing that here in Spain, it was hard for us to understand that, that some, sometimes companies changed it, but in Spain, people thought that being in a company uh, was only for Spaniards, but contemporary dance companies, the usual thing is to have a very international uh, group of dancers, which is what enriches the company, right? But when you arrived to Rambert, were you the only Spaniard? Yes, I was. Lots of Australians at the Rambert because I ended up in Australia and my life has always had connections with Australia. I never thought I would end up in Australia because this was never part of the plan. Lots of Australians in, at the Rambert that went to Europe to find a life because in, in Australia, there isn't so much work as a dancer. So you either go abroad because in Australia as a dancer, you can dance for a long time, but there is a window and with certain companies, there is an age, right? And it's over. Things are changing, fortunately, but it was a bit like that. 
now that I think about it, I got in the wrong boat and I thought, I have such a long way to go. And I saw people there and I was sort of like really in ecstatic. I was like, Rumbert at the time had a repertoire of Cunningham, the Childs, Sue Davis, Christopher Bruce. Imagine, I mean, a repertoire company. And I was a boy. I like, I was a boy who liked to dance in his village, but then I became a dancer. I wanted to be a dancer. And then I'm in a dance company, right? And I have a salary. So everything was like exciting, thrilling. And I work in a company which without knowing, me knowing, it's gonna be the best school for choreography. Because the itinerary as a dancer is not pre-established as you do when you're a doctor or mathematician. How do you define your career as a choreographer or to be a good or a bad dancer? And it's a constant learning. You're always preparing to be. So it's a continuous process. You always learn. You always, you know, get prepare your body, insist on it. It's a daily challenge. And may, maybe this is a bit of putting. This, it's also a lot of investment, a big investment. I mean, I imagine your parents, I mean, I remember my parents, my parents were always doing, you know, making a big effort financially for me to go to Madrid to, to take lessons. Sometimes you take the toilet paper on a weekly basis, then private tuition. And this is a constant investment for your child. So your preparation is a constant investment. Yeah, I remember the second year in London, my father gave me 100,000 pesetas. And he said, when you finish, when you when you run out of money, you come back. And I thought, okay, and I got a job at the theater and I never came back. That's why I said I had a salary because at the end, you got, I got the training and then, you know, I was very lucky. I would have never been able to pay for the school unless I got the scholarship. I had to get around with my living expensive, eat sort of like my allowance, right? But the rest, the actual tuition fees uh, were part of the scholarship. Otherwise it would have been impossible because it was such a lot of money. And how long were you at the Lambert, Rumbert? I was 12 years at the Rumbert Dance Company. So, I mean, you've done so many things in your life. You've, you've been really productive because I do my maths and everybody who is listening to this thinking, so to 12 years here and then 31 years, this man has done so many things. You've been really productive. You've been busy, right? Yeah, 12 years there, dancing. You are a person who has that loyalty, loyalty to places. And that says a lot about you. Yeah, I, I am a very loyal person. I came back to the Rambert a, a few years ago. They did one of my pieces. I ended up being associate choreographer and choreography kept me there longer because this is a, a big company and they had, they, they let uh, dancers to do choreography. So I told Chris, for Bruce, he said, I want to do a piece. And he said, no, you can't, you're too young. And I said, well, I'm too young to dance. I'm too young to do a piece. Because every, he had everything very old school. And at the end, he allowed me to do a piece. And I said, okay, you go ahead. And that piece in 1998 was part of the Rumbert repertoire. And it was premiered at the Charles Wells, Sadler's Wells. So when I think about it, it's a, it's a bit of a dream, but I had this determination of saying, every minute counts, I need to do it. And then I never stopped. Then dance and choreography at the same time. As a dancer, if he had always wanted to dance, maybe I would have 
on other things. But since I started with choreography, I've been in a company with dancer, with a space, which you said earlier, with a respected company, with a space to rehearse, because dancing and choreography can't be done at home. It's not a, an art form that you could do at home. Well, I have done it, but you need the space. You need the dancers. The floor needs to be a floor good enough to dance. And people don't understand that. So that's it, 12 years went by. But you say, you start choreography, but I mean, you have such a push. People who don't know you personally, now you know we know you more just through this screen, but you have such a push. With El Arbil, we always say, El Arba is such an act, uh, uh, Bonatella is such an active person with so much energy. When you were 20, you, you must have had such a huge energy. But that is what makes you who you are as part of your personality. But also you are in a space such as Rambert where the company members have that choice or that possibility to create. And that's very important because as you know, in ballet, I always have the feeling that everything, dance companies, uh, and there is an evolution and a transformation. The big companies, the classical companies have opened up to contemporary dance. But cl classical ballet has been a little bit more strict. In flamenco, you create your own things. This is your stars. With four steps, you put together. You see one here, one there. But the idea of choreography is quite limited to solos but is part of, of the process, your own process. To perform, to dance, you need to choreography your piece. You work with live music, so everything is done at the same time. And that's part of the richness of the wealth of flamenco. But in contemporary dance, creativity is more present. And, but it, I think Rambert period was very important for you so that you had the space and the possibility to, to be there for you from the beginning. Yeah, and in flamenco, you, you all, you know, you, you create your own pieces, your solos. When did you decide, I want to choreography? Not just for me, but for your company. When did you decide to go for choreography? Did you always see it, see it as part of you to do choreography? I think it's important who you work with or who you meet. For me, because of what you're saying, working with Antonio Gades was very important. The scenic approach to flamenco, there were two schools of doing things, working with flamenco. Now that is completely flat and it's, what we did in Seville was more focused on traditional flamenco with great artists coming out of there. When I was young, I mean, Farruko was there, Matilde Coral, Rafael El Negro was there in Seville, Pepa Coral, Carmen Ledesma, Teresa Luna. So flamenco dancers, such as Maribel Romero, fantastic artists, but they were very focused in the herself, themselves. You know, perfectly dressed, perfectly created, everything was perfect, but very solo, very individual. But the idea of a choreography or a scenography, I started seeing it with Mario Maya. But before I had been with Antonio Gades in Madrid, and I saw that there was a different concept, a brand new concept, which is to consider dance as a performing art, as a scenic art. During rehearsal with Antonio Mogades, he would stay till very late at night during the lighting. 
and I had never seen it before. Then I started to, to in research more. I felt an interest for flamenco as a performing art. And then eventually I was with Gadez and I had been with Gadez with three years doing Carmen, blood weddings, and uh, I learned a lot, the film Carmen. I remember that. I mean, it was when Paco de Lucia was the king of guitar, in guitar and music and dance as well. It was the big influence between music and dance in the world of flamenco. And I thought, I thought I could. I had to try, but I couldn't do in both things. And I told Gades, Antonio, listen, I'm going to try to do choreography. So I need to leave the company, but I was crying. I was sleepless the night before because of the, you know, I felt really sad because I, I thought the, the Antonio Gades company had given me a lot. I really admired him and I was going to betray him. So I felt really, really awful. I felt really awful and I went to his dressing room. I was so nervous and I said this to him and he said to me, it was one of the big lessons that he said to me, you know what, Maria? I think you can do it. So go for it. And now other people would say, oh, you can't do that. You're betraying me. No, no, this is all. That's being an artist, a great artist and a great master. Yeah, this is people who give you a lesson for life, a living lesson in a way. And I started. Okay, so I started and then at the beginning, I didn't really know. I didn't could even envisage I could, but that's it. You learn as you go and you learn from your mistakes more than from your success. And choreography, either you practice it or it doesn't work. I don't think you can learn it overnight, but you need to do it as you go in the space with the bodies, with, with the artists that you're creating with. And that's essential. And you, a question. I mean, I'm still there, right? I'm at the, in the middle of that process. I'm 58, I'm right in the middle of that process. But this idea of us stop dancing. Did you stop dancing? Did, did you say I stop? How, did, how do you do that? Well, what a big moment in your life. I mean, big milestone. Right, 12 years at Rambert. That was 11 months a year with a month of holiday like a full day job right investing my time saturdays we worked so i always compare it with when you're a freelance i mean you have a bit of a break but physically 12 years of one month of holidays a year when i started choreographing it was a point when i thought I think I stopped dancing when I was 32 or 34, but I, I, I was appointed associate choreographer. So I was given a position as such, and they said to me, okay, you can dance and do choreography as well. And I said, all right. So if I had a job as a choreographer, I could go do it and then come back and dance. And I did that for two years. And then at the end, my body couldn't really cope with it anymore. You can't go on stage and go through that unless you are doing that every day. And then there was an opportunity of a job which came up and I couldn't do it because I had to dance in Aberdeen, in Scotland, right? Aberdeen, Aberdeen, yes. So we traveled everywhere in the world, but there was a lot of English tours. I mean, I know England better than I know Spain. I have done 12 years of touring in England from village to village. And that's so beautiful. And that's one of the things that have been very important for me in my life. And that's why I'm still fighting for that. In England, dance is fully supported and promoted. There are networks of theaters for small companies, big companies. Each city, a small and medium city, has a theater for a big company, such as Rambert, and for a company with six dancers. 
and England is uh, dance is very part of the education, a part of the syllabus, is part of, of life in England. And that's very important for me because I learned a lot on how I could do things later on here, like try and do more education. And we did a lot of education for children, a lot of creativity, awareness and work with children. Anyway, so I got a job, I couldn't do it. And I thought, all right, now, I, I sort of when I weigh things of what makes me happy and what dancing sort of part time is not something that I like, it's not fair. And choreography, I love it, but there is a moment in time when you need to go for it full time, so you can't do it part time. And I had never been a solo choreographer. Uh, it's interesting, funnily enough, I danced at work once because somebody had an injury. And in Sadler's Wells, a dancer had an injury and I knew the dance and the dancers looked at me and said, you're dancing tonight. And I said, no, I don't want to dance. I don't want to dance my own piece. But in contemporary, and I was like, I had two days to do it and I danced it, but it was, it was the, the only time. So I took the step, I left Rambert without just just to be a freelance i didn't have a job office nothing but did you stay in england or did you go back no no i stayed in england because after being with rambert they had supported me they had invested me in me as a choreographer all my contacts everybody i knew everything I knew was in England. In Barcelona, I had been, I mean, I had been away from Barcelona for 14 years. I didn't know the scene in Barcelona. And whenever I went back to Barcelona, people, it was hard. I mean, I always said, bravo, you're still fighting in Barcelona, but it's so hard. I mean, whenever I went back to Barcelona, the situation didn't look very appealing, actually. But deep inside, deep inside, did you have the idea of going back to Barcelona or when you left Barcelona, you left for good? Because this idea of dance and diaspora cycle, once they reflect upon that, actually, you had to live because what you wanted to do here didn't exist. We don't have structure for dance. We don't, unfortunately, this is the situation in Spain still. So, you had to live, right? Just to go and do your things. And at the time, this is what they, they were doing in the world with the exception of Spain and in many advanced countries. But deep inside, did you want to go back to Barcelona or did you live for good knowing that that was it? Was that, was that a bit of a trauma for you or, and, or something that you had decided and it wasn't a big priority to go back? How did you how did you tackle this romantically maybe yes the idea of going back home to barcelona spain i was born there my family yeah but i also tried to find out and i knew it was very difficult and it would be very difficult suddenly go to barcelona to write and uh, to apply for the government and to receive funding to start a project. I was listening to Le Anonima, Mudanzas, other companies in Spain. I was still in touch with them and I knew how difficult it was. Like companies would have a harsh time because there was no subsidies. And if I wanted to work in choreography and give choreography a chance, I mean, I must mention also that I had started with a double life. I wanted to be a choreographer of contemporary dance. That was my passion. And this is what I do now. But I was choreographing commercially for Kali Minogue, for Tina Tana, for perfume adverts. And thanks to that freelancing work, I could finance my company. Those jobs were not in Barcelona or Madrid. Those jobs weren't anywhere in Europe for pop videos, etc., And there was a point in time when I could do that. 
And I could have seen it as something like, no, I'm a purist, contemporary dancer. I'm not going to go into that. I don't want to get polluted. Yes, yeah, polluted, exactly, contaminated. And then I was a point in time when I thought, in any way, even though Rambert gave me a lot of opportunities, I don't know if I can survive the contemporary dance world as a independent choreographer with my own voice because I was a privileged professional because I was paid as a dancer and suddenly I could do pieces and that person supported and believed in me. But will I survive? Because in England, there was a lot, the, the choreography scene was really booming. So I knew. So I went to the Lace Prize, which is the most important prize for contemporary dance, because I saw the advert and I thought, I'm going to go for it. So I applied for it and I won the award, which were £30,000, which is a lot of money. And with that money, I got a producer. And between that and the jobs, freelance jobs, commercial jobs, in London, they would call me for videos, primary steam or whatever. I don't know, like a mobile phone would be launched, whatever. I did it. And I could finance with that money whatever I wanted to do to help myself. I understand you so well, Rafa, because there is a parallel synergy with river dance what happened to me with river dance i saw river dance and i thought this has nothing to do with the career i had in mind and what i am doing now but it's true when the project started in 1992 during the universal exhibition in seville seville became the epicenter of the world and i was i saw myself surrounded by I mean, I, I, I can relate to what you say. I can relate with what you said really well, because I had these amazing Irish musicians, super artists, legends of Irish music, which Celtic music was super trendy. And I said, I can dance that. And then river dance stemmed from there. But then it took shape. And it's true that at some point you say, this is not what I want to do, but you feel that you have the economic capacity to invest in your own personal project. And I had that opportunity to get that money to invest in my own personal project and to develop my company and to have the resources I needed to do a good show. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to fund it. So in life, you make decisions and you take pathways that are nice. It makes, the, it makes sense. Maybe not artistically, but it will help you to develop your own. There was a point in time when I didn't really know, will I become a contemporary dance choreographer with my own company? That was my dream. My dream was having my own company, your own company. Exactly. I thought, listen, I'm here. It's, it's, I'd rather find out now, sooner than, rather than later, whether I can do it. Because contemporary dance started working. I ended up with my own small da contemporary dance. So I left Rambert. I got the replace prize with the money that, you know, that went well. So if you're going to do an award, give money to the award because it's good for artists. And it also... It's a bit of a push to have European co-productions. And I, say, I thought, OK, I'm going to do the Bonatella Dance Company in December 2005. It was a charity. I had to learn a lot of business org. It was hard. But 2008. I was called by the Sydney Dance Company. I had my own company. I did contemporary dance projects with collaborators, you know, like composers, musicians, visual artists. The flower market co-produced and we went to Barcelona and I felt connected somehow with Spain. 
Madrid in Danza, Valencia. So for me, being able to go back with my dancers and with my company, that was such a human amazing feeling. And I'm, I'm here in Australia, right? And I'm very happy to be here because this is where I ended up, but I don't know where I'll end up eventually. It could be Spain, but we're still having our own ambitions and goals. This is a need to do what I do. I do it because I need to do it. And also to try and find a space for you to allow it. Anyway, those of you who are listening to us today, you can ask questions. Please ask questions, anything. If you have you know, curiosity, you want to know more about things, go and ask questions. You've introduced a topic, which, well, after Rambert, then Bonachella runs company, then you go to Sydney, and then in Sydney, you develop, we'll know that. You've been there for 13 years, right? Yes, this is my 12th season. I started in 2009, and this is the 12th year. But imagine you're in a company, official, right? It belongs to the government, right? Or to the City Council of Sydney? How does your company work? In Australia, the company is funded from the national government, but in Australia, the government of the budget we need to operate for a year, we receive from the government 35% of our financing. And I've done my research. In Europe, you get 80 or 90%. But here, this is one of the companies, I mean, the national or the state government, New South Wales from Sydney gives us money. The federal government gives us some money and both of them make up for enough to pay the salaries of 150 employees. 150 employees here. It used to be a dance company and now we have become a national education center with 50 students for two years. So it's been a big transformation. When I arrived here, things were rather awful, but I would like to advise all artists to interview for companies and they should always ask how the finances are because I never ask about finances in my interview and that's very important. And then I realized that the company was at an atrocious financial situation when I arrived, but hey, we did it. It's something that, that was a bit of a heritage for me. I learned a lesson and I always tell the choreographers or people who want to direct an artistic organization, before you join in, ask them to show them their account. I mean, that's important because you can have really good projects, but you need resources. Interestingly, I don't know if you, those of you who are listening, maybe you agree, but don't you realize that in this conversation, sometimes, sometimes, because this is important. Sometimes we talk about money. When you direct a company, it's not only about the artistic side, but you need to manage, business manage the company that gives you so that you can develop your artistic project and you become a business manager. And now when you explain to us how when you arrived to Sydney and you found a project that didn't have appropriate funding and one of the big and success and jobs that you've done well is to consolidate the project and develop it to give it a big dimension and to get the financing because the institutional financing is not enough. So that's a huge feat, right? In Australia, in England, uh, I got philanthropic support a little bit, Rambert had it, but there wasn't such a big need because the English government supports you and they believe it's important to support companies. In England, when, when we talked about politics, 
in England, they understood 20 years ago what the creative industries are, meaning that art is done for many reasons, but art is good for the economy. Even though they don't want to see the figures, arts and performing arts give life to the economy and they create money. In Australia, we get 30% 30, 30 of our annual financing is philanthropic to individual donations and 35 is self-generated, which is ticket sales. Sometimes I've been to Germany doing choreography for a company and theaters are full, I must say, but here, here in Australia, you need to sell tickets because each ticket is part of our living. We rent out the theater. The theater is not ours. We rent it. The government says, you're the business senior side that some company, here you have a theater. You can perform there twice a year. No, not at all. We need to rent it and pay for the rent of the theater where we perform. So it's a completed way of seeing art. But it's worth it for me. I have a team, and this is the way things are here. I can't go against them. I will fight for more support, not just for me, but for everyone, all the arts and dance. And one of the things I learned, which I know you do, which is very important, and that is to support other artists. So through the very privileged position I have of having a company with 16 dancers and being able to create, when I uh, did my interview in 2008, I said, Sydney Dance Company, it can't be just myself, a company with 16 dancers, with government support, with five studios by the sea. You've been here, right? Of course I have. It's amazing. I mean, uh, good. I, uh, it's clear I have stayed. This is amazing. This is incredible. They didn't. They were not aware of what they had here as a dance center. So yes, there was a wow moment. We need to pay all this money to the government. We did it, and then the company has improved. The time I spent in the office. As a director, I mean, being a choreographer is one thing and arriving, doing the choreography and you leave. But when you have your own company, which I did, and then you lead a huge company like such as these, you need to work with budgets, marketing, press, education, the tour. So it's managed as a lot of management. It's not just this, this studio floor. And sometimes I have to force myself to go back to the studio. Yeah, they, they have to drag you out of your office to take you to the rehearsal. Yeah, my team knows that the month when I am rehearsing, they have, it has to be something very important for me to do something else. And it works really well. So when I need to choreograph, I need to go lock myself in the study. Looking for financing money is like fundraisers, dinners, galas. You need to devote a lot of time. Sometimes you say, I sometimes think, I mean, who else can do this? Because I spend a whole day in the office, I need to go home because I have a dinner that evening with 100 people or 80 people as a fundraiser. I need to convince them and go fundraising. I need to stand up and say how important it is to have the support. And in Australia, people are really nice. They're really nice people. They really, really are. It's, it's not like in America. I have heard situations in America, people who give you money and telling you what you have to do, but I have never, ever, ever felt in that position. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Nobody has told me what to do. I've always been given absolute freedom. So you need to work and look for money to continue, but under no prerequisites and under no conditions. And, and that's important. I feel I'm very lucky. People who philanthropists give you money and they don't ask you what you're going to do with them. They just support you and they understand 
they understand what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I'm listening to you, right? And and this is a little bit more resounding the conversations that we all have, the need for financing that exists in dance. But of course, each country has their own way of doing things, their own background, idiosyncrasy, and the cultural industries. I think we should do, we should think about what Spain is because it's all good. I mean, we need to analyze in Spain, dance has not been acknowledged at the level it should be, not politically, not socially. But one of the things we are trying to do in our choreography center is to try and attract people who have a political responsibility and who make decisions and above all to push, to create a regulation in, in, in Spain, because what you are saying, we have two institutional companies, central companies funded by the state, the National Ballet, the National Dance Company, and these projects need a different way of working because they don't succeed or consolidate as a project. We have had 40 years of national company. And how do you see this? The project is not consolidating. Every four years you change director, every eight years you change director. There is no project as such, a national project. That there are, they have small budgets and then nationally, you've talked about the Sydney dance company in Sydney, but we have the Andalusian Flamenco Ballet, which is not consolidating either after so many years. Here in Fuenlabrada, there's one in Madrid, Fuenlabrada in the periphery. But if we manage to create a choreography center here and from here give voice to dance, we could also create a company, right? I mean, it's not always a matter of money. It's always a matter of will of having systems, strategies and a project. We need projects. Will well, LRB is continuous and we're always focused here and we always feel the need to launch new initiatives and to debate things, to agitate things, to stir things. How can we make progress? In England and Australia, we have the Arts Council which is independent from the government. As far as I, I mean, I've been out of Spain for 31 years, so I understand what you're saying, but I don't know how it works for you. In Spain, when the government changes, does everything change in culture? Yeah, and that is the problem. Here, the government changes, but people in the Arts Council working with theater or dance, they're not a political party. They don't have in special interest. And that's a big problem. If the Ministry of Culture is a political appointment and when the weather changes, the appointees change, well, that's a problem. And where do we learn from? I, it was easy for me to come from England to Australia because Australia has found a role model in England. But each year I have a meeting with the Arts Council and when we present everything, you can go to my website and you can look at the, re download the report with the expenditure. It's everything is very transparent. And as I remember from Spain, it wasn't like that. I mean, transparency, I can give you information. We publish our data. In Spain, for example, the Ministry of Culture invests 0.3% of the general budget in culture, only 0.3. And culture gives to GDP 3.2 of the GDP. So imagine 
culture gives more than what we receive and we receive it because we need it in other countries one percent goes to culture from the general budget but here it doesn't here we are sort of like waiting and see there aren't any criteria of regulation there isn't a cultural project in spain of what culture we want and that independence is very important the political situation with the autonomous government and there are different responsibilities in culture and do it is very fragmented there isn't a state project with a state pact for culture that would be key so that everybody would be joining forces to create a powerful culture in spain that doesn't exist and that's why we're always with so many ups and downs well that's a pity because a country with so much talent and people living in spain and and that that should have been solved but people should do what you are doing, your own initiative, your own way of being very political with what you do, and to bring all of us together to talk and have in your center. You say that you are in the periphery, but the periphery is very important. It's very important to, to, to have things scattered. We can't have everything centralized. We need to spread around culture. I imagine, I have the feeling that there is a lot of bureaucracy in Spain, right? Yeah, I mean, you talked about the theatres that you need to rent it out. Most theatres that program dance or more scenic space are public. And theatres are public. There is a private industry, but it's smaller. That is good. In the 90s, many theaters were built, but without a big content. Or with a content that didn't have continuity. So, yeah, I know what you're talking about, and that's a pity. But anyway, we should join forces and push together. Here at the center, we are trying to create a community because that's just another point. The Maria Pajes is choreography center. It's a dance center. It doesn't belong to me. We have LRB there pushing really strongly. We are proposing many things, but the most interesting thing to be able to push is to create a community. I mean, you can't have individual initiatives because you don't get anywhere. I think we have questions. Carmen Galán asks, would like to know your opinion about dance as an universal expression or unique cultural identity. As a universal expression, Yes, absolutely. Unique cultural identity. Well, I don't know. What do you think about this? I don't want to be the one answering. Okay, you've answered really well. Dance and all arts, for me, give shape to our culture and strengthen how we are as a society. Arts in general, dance, of course, we all have a body. That's what we do. But for me, of course, it enriches, it enriches our souls, especially now when we have so many problems socially, financially, geopolitically, and when there is so much change, the arts are more important than ever. Because for me, they are the voice to understand, to describe the world, the crazy world we live in. The arts give voice to those who don't have a voice. Dance may be a going off beast, but creativity of arts touches us directly in a unique manner with a greater impact as well.
more than nothing. Yes, and I think that art gives voice to human beings in a direct and sincere manner. Connecting what makes us humans being you humans, which is our emotions. Sometimes I feel sorry that people don't acknowledge culture because we would be a better society if we would acknowledge and value arts. I mean, what do we do? Those of us working in arts, we just reflect upon things that we live and experience and listen to. We are a dissemination of what people feel and are. Arts make us think, provoke us, and express how society feels and give sense to the madness that we live in. That is why I go crazy when people don't acknowledge the value of dance and art. Yeah. Well, I think we can finish with this idea. If our conversation I mean, imagine a life, a world without dance, without literature, without architecture or film. It's devast it would be devastating. So we need to continue fighting. We do. And we need to continue convincing of what you have just said. Okay, Rafa, I think we need to finish here. It was incredible to talk to you. I could talk to you for hours because both of us like talking, so we could be here for hours. And the topic is, is very juicy. <laughs> but anyway, we need to live, we need to go. I want to thank you for your time. You're a fantastic person. Uh, and uh, we have seen in your conversation your generosity, enthusiasm, your professionality, and your enthusiasm for life and dance. Thank you for opening up this cycle of dance and diaspora. I want to thank the Cervantes Institute for being there. Acción Cultural is also there supporting. And, uh, from here to the whole team of Instituto Cervantes, Coral in Sydney, here in the center, all the staff, we have the City Council of Fue Labrada, who is also supporting us, El Arbi, who is always there working hard, all the technicians, everyone. Thank you, thank you all, because this has been possible thanks to you. We will continue next week. And we are with Nazare Panadero Pamao. She will be joining us from Frankfurt at the Cervantes Institute there. So we will have another conversation. Uh, thank you very much, Rafa. We love you. And uh, bon courage and continue. Keep on with the good work. You have an amazing project, the Sydney Dance Company. So thank you. Goodbye. And those of you who are there, thank you for being there. See you soon. Ciao, ciao.